This morning when I was getting ready for church, I'm sure that a lot of you, if you had on the TV, on any kind of a news station at all, you're well aware that 15 years ago, the tragedy that took place here in our nation, the United States of America, and the planes hitting not only the Twin Towers, but also the Pentagon and Flight 93 that went down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, which is real close to where I was raised, <clears throat> the tragic loss of lives. Our general superintendent has issued a statement. He said, in a year which marks the 15th anniversary of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, is a presidential election year and has seen tens of thousands in America alone struggle from the results of natural disasters. And he's asking that today we spend some time in prayer as a church, and we certainly are going to be doing that tonight at our War Room prayer. He said, I'm asking Assemblies of God churches to pray for America and to dedicate today in praying for America. Already in 2016, the United States and the world has witnessed an intensifying of global terrorism, increasing violence within cities, a growing revelation of the extent of human trafficking, and an increased political, physical, and spiritual attack on the church worldwide. He closes out by saying, our world needs God. <clears throat> but listen, more importantly, our world needs God's people to pray and to show compassionate care. Today I want to speak to you with the help of the Holy Spirit on the subject of the unspoken. If you have your Bible, I would ask if you would to turn with me to 1 Kings, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel rather, chapter 12, 1 Samuel chapter 12. We want to look at one verse there as we begin this morning. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. Israel wanted to be like everyone else. They had been a theocracy. They had been under the rulership of God. God was their king. They no longer were happy. They wanted to be like everyone else. They wanted a king that they could see. They wanted a king that could lead them into battle. They wanted a king that could be a sign of their strength, of their sovereignty, if you will. And, you know, sad to say, sometimes wanting to be like everybody else is not necessarily always the best choice, is it? And Samuel was bemoaning the fact, and God had spoken to Samuel and told him, he said, Samuel, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. And isn't it amazing the similarities between the nation of Israel and the nation of America? As Trevor mentioned, we have certainly been blessed in the fact that God has protected us with his hand when we were a nation that was serving the Lord. But I know that you are aware of the fact, without me even mentioning it, how far America has strayed away from the values and the morals that are established in God's word. And instead of drawing closer to God, we are trying to get God out of our society out of our lives as a nation, and it seems like the more that we can do to get people to not even give a thought to the Lord anymore, the more pleased our society as a whole has been. So what's going to turn this around? Well, I believe the answer is found here in verse 23 of 1 Samuel chapter 12, where Samuel is speaking to the people, and he says, moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Friend, I submit to you at the very beginning of our message this morning that it is incumbent upon you and I as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a born-again believer, that we are spokespersons for the Lord in the fact, not necessarily getting up on a stump and preaching or even standing behind the pulpit and preaching, but that we spend time on our knees interceding on behalf of our nation and our fellow man. And that we spend time in prayer. Notice Samuel says, I don't want to sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, 
but I will teach you the good and the right way in direct contradiction to what is being taught in our public classroom, in contradiction to what is being taught across the airways of most of our broadcasting networks, in contradiction to what is even being preached in a lot of pulpits this morning, I believe that the Lord would have us to teach the good and the right way that is set forth in the Word of God. Bow your head with me in prayer, if you would. Heavenly Father, I thank you today so much that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I'm so thankful for your Holy Spirit, and I thank you, Lord, that you give guidance and direction to those who will diligently and earnestly seek your face. Holy Spirit, I need you to walk before me into this pulpit this morning to anoint my mind and my mouth afresh, and I pray, Lord, that the word that comes forth will be your word. Thank you for the privilege of being your messenger today, your spokesperson. I do not take this lightly. Lord, I pray this morning that your anointing will rest not only upon your servant, but upon every hearer that is here, anoint their ears. Help us to be responsive to your word and recognize the importance of praying, not just in church, but every day, throughout the day, and praying for one another. Might you be glorified in all that is about to take place. We thank you, Lord, that you've honored us with your presence. We've sensed you here. And most importantly, if someone is here who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, my prayer is that before this service draws to a close, that your Holy Spirit will begin to convict. And Lord, that they will indeed come to know Christ. Not only know that you exist, but know that you're a personal God who wants to have a relationship with each of us. For this we'll give you praise and all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you remember where you were 15 years ago when the tragic events of 9-11 took place? I remember very well, I was with my wife's grandmother. We were at a local dentist here over by the mall. And when we walked in, they were showing tower number one of the Twin Towers on fire. And they were saying that a plane had hit it. And I have to confess, when I first saw that, that I thought that I was watching some kind of a preview for a movie, a Hollywood movie. I had no idea that it was live coverage. And then I looked in the upper right-hand corner, and there were four letters of a word that said L-I-V-E, live. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness. And as I was watching it, about 10 minutes later, the second plane flew into the second tower and exploded and set it on fire as well. I remember very vividly how everybody just gave out a gasp and how we were there in shock and could not believe that the United States of America had been attacked on home soil. Of course, as the events of the day unfolded, you're all aware of the fact that the plane crashed into the Pentagon and another plane that was headed to the Capitol crashed in Shanksville because of the bravery of the men and the women that were there on Flight 93. Do you recall in the days following how, as a nation, people started praying and return to God, and instead of God being on a back burner, isn't it amazing that in the time of crisis, God is the first one that we turn to? We say that we don't want God. We say as a nation that we're big boys, big girls. We don't need God. We can stand on our own. We can put our trust in our military. We can put our trust in the monetary system. We can put our trust in this or that or whatever. But when a catastrophe hits, it's amazing how we recognize our frailty and our complete dependency upon the Lord. But the tragedy of it is, is how quickly we forget about our complete dependency upon God for our existence. I would submit to you today that unspoken prayer is the weakest link in the American church. I fear that many times we have been seduced by Satan into believing it is enough for you and I to have hired professionals to do our praying for us. What do I mean by that? Well, let's be honest. How many times do we allow pastors, evangelists, missionaries, or someone in the church that we have a lot of respect for, to do our praying for us. That the only time that we pray, perhaps is at mealtime, or perhaps before we go to bed, but really praying every day, beginning my day in prayer, living my day in prayer, 
ending my day in prayer. I mean, let me begin this morning by asking you, how much time do you really spend in prayer? Unless you think I'm standing up here throwing stones at you and judging you and whatever, I want you to know that I confess to you, I don't pray enough. Now, if I were to tell you how much I pray in a day, you might sit there and say, well, pastor, my goodness, you know, this, that, or whatever. You might think that I'm bragging or, or whatever. But the point that I'm making to you is this. I don't pray enough, and I know that. I allow the busyness of my day to crowd out time that I need to be in prayer. And when I'm talking about prayer, I'm not talking about the fact that I need to be on my knees with my hands folded and my eyes shut and whatever. Friends, you can pray anytime, anywhere. And we need to understand that. And we need to involve God in our lives, in prayer, in every decision that I render, in living daily life, recognizing my complete dependency upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, instead of being something we do every day, it seems to become like that little glass-covered box on the wall that says, break glass in case of emergency. You know what I'm talking about? And a lot of times, that's how you and I regard prayer as well. Break glass in case of emergency and get down to business with God. You know, I wonder how many times is it that you and I are reluctant to go to God in prayer because I haven't spent time with him and I'm embarrassed to go to him when I need him and I've forgotten to thank him for the many, many blessings that he gives me on a daily basis. Why is it that when most of us think about prayer, we associate it with some kind of crisis in our life? I read a story the other day in preparing for this sermon about a man who encountered a bit of a, tr of a problem while flying his plane. Listen to this, Dwight. He called the control tower and said, Pilot to tower, I'm 300 miles from shore, 600 feet above the ocean, and I'm out of fuel. I'm descending rapidly. Please advise, over. The dispatcher came back and said, Tower to pallet. Repeat after me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You see, the fact of the matter is, a lot of times... The only time that we call out on God is when we're in trouble. How much better it would be if I'm on familiar terminology with the Lord, that I've talked to God every day, that I've recognized that God is a very important part of my life, and anything that I will enjoy, anything that I will have you know, received, anything that I have, anything that I will ever be, is a direct result of God being a part of my life and God's blessing. And may I be quick to say undeserved blessing many times in my life that God has been benevolent enough to pour out on us. You see, my friend, prayer is often neglected in our attempt to build a healthy spiritually church. It's talked about more than anything else and practiced less than anything else. And yet for the Christian believer, it remains one of the greatest gifts that God has given to you and I outside of the gift of salvation itself. The Apostle Paul was someone who understood prayer and its power. Prayer was a part of Paul's life and he took for granted that Christians would pray. May I submit to you this morning, you cannot really be a good Christian and not pray. I'm going to say that again. You cannot really be a good Christian and not pray. Prayer is the pipeline of communication between God and people who truly love Him. In Colossians 4.2, Paul instructs the Christians at the Church of Colossae to continue earnestly in prayer. And if you do a, a study of that in the original Greek, you'll find out that the word translated continuous earnestly is one word. It can be translated persist in, adhere firmly to, or remain devoted to. It carries with it the idea of dedication. In other words, regardless of what the day may hold, I'm going to begin my day in prayer. I'm going to recognize that I need guidance, that I'm going to need wisdom beyond myself, that I'm going to need God's hand there to guide me and direct me and to help me to make wise choices. So therefore, I am recognizing my dependency upon the Lord. I'm acknowledging that fact. And when I walk out of my house in the morning through that door, I know I'm not going out of it alone, but praise God, God is right there by my side. It gives us a courage. It gives us a hope. It gives us a peace of mind that no matter what the day may hold, praise God, my God already knows about it and my God already has the answer. You know, it's a very powerful word, this idea of persistence. And in this verse, it's stated as a command. Friend, understand with me that persistence in prayer is not an option for the Christian. 
Two of the most instructive parables Jesus ever told on the subject of prayer talked about not giving up while we are praying. In Luke chapter 11, verses 5 through 8, Jesus tells the story of a man going to a friend's house late at night and knocking on the door and asking him to borrow some food because he's had an unexpected visit from another friend who had stopped by to spend the night and he doesn't have any food in the house. The first friend responds that everyone in the household is asleep and the children are asleep around him and he doesn't want to wake them up or disturb them by getting up and going to the pantry and getting some food. Yet because of the persistence of the friend in need, he gets up and gives him what he needs. In Matthew 7, 7, we find the promise that says, Ask and it will be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Each of these verbs are in the present tense and could very well be translated, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Friend, that's how it is with my prayers and with yours, that I am persistent, that I'm not giving up on the matter, that I'm bringing it to God's attention, not that he has amnesia, not that God forgets, but that God indeed wants me to bring my needs before him on a constant basis until I've received the answer. If you've ever read the, uh, the book of Daniel, you read there in Daniel chapter 10 how for 21 days Daniel prayed and asked God to intervene on behalf of a situation in Daniel's life. 21 days later, there was an angel from the Lord that brought the answer to Daniel's prayer, and he told him what? He said, Daniel, on the first day that you prayed, God sent me, dispatched me from heaven to come and bring the answer to your prayer, but I was held up in the heavenlies by the principalities of the air in reference to Satan. You see, Satan is a great discourager, and Satan knows if he can intercede, or intercept rather, and keep the answer to my prayers from getting through, that I'll give up, and when I quit praying, I tie the hands of God. But I want you to know something today. Satan is not all-powerful. Only God, Jehovah God, is all-powerful. Amen? Satan is not omniscient. He does not know all things. He only knows by what he sees in my actions. He only overhears my conversations. So be careful what you say. Keep your trust in the Lord. Keep praying and know that the answer is on the way. And if you haven't received the answer to your prayer yet, be persistent until the answer is there because God heard you the first day that you prayed. God set the answer to your prayer on the first day that you prayed. It may not have happened yet, but that does not mean it will not happen. As you persist in prayer, it's very clear that Jesus Christ does not want you or me to give up in praying for someone or something. That's why I'm such a, a, a firm advocate of war room prayer. That's why I'm asking you and, 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 and just doing everything that I possibly can to help you to understand the importance of war room prayer. Friends, it's not just a one-time thing, but it's something that we need to do as a church if we really want to see Rockingham County, the city of Harrisonburg and the surrounding counties, Augusta County, Page County, Shenandoah County, and, and Pendleton County to our west. Friends, if we really want to see revival break out, it's going to require you and I getting on our knees and praying. You may say, well, no one else is doing it. That's the problem. No one else is doing it. Or we're believing that somebody else is doing it, so therefore they're doing it for me. God wants you and I on our knees praying on behalf of our nation. If ever there's going to be a spiritual awakening, it's going to take place through prayer. Now listen. We need to understand there's a difference between a persistent prayer and a long prayer. I know a lot of people that are very good at praying a very, very long time. But friends, that's not what God's talking about. He's not talking about praying a long prayer. He's talking about praying in a persistent manner. It can be very brief. It can be something that, you know, just, just states the basics. Remember Joe Friday? Those of you that are older, remember the movie, or, or the show, rather, on TV, Dragnet? Okay? You remember what he used to say? Just the facts, man. Well, that's how it is with God. God says a lot of times when I'm up here, and, and look, I know I've been teased about whatever, that, oh, my goodness, Jeff, when you pray, you pray for all the missionaries in Africa. You pray for all the missionaries in, in Europe. You pray for all the missionaries in South America. You pray for this one and that one and whatever. Friend, may I be quick to point out to you, sometimes we need to pray, and I'm not trying to justify my long prayers. What I'm saying is simply this. Sometimes we don't have to be long prayers, and thank God they don't have to be because sometimes I don't have time to pray a long prayer. You ever been driving down the road and had a tractor and trailer come out at you out of nowhere, cut you off? All you have to say is, Jesus! That's all you have time for, you know? And I'm not, and I'm not you know, or, oh, Jesus! 
or help. I mean, you know, but, but may I go on record and tell you that that prayer is just as important as, oh, most holy God, I bow in humble reverence today, and I thank you, Lord, that you protected me from that tractor and trailer. And, oh, God, if you could just keep him on his side of the line, and, you know, we go on and on and on. I don't have time for all that. That guy just tried to cut me off, and he missed me by a gnat's eyelash. Help! You know what I'm saying? It's being persistent. Persistence simply means not giving up. Not giving up that I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Can you say amen? I'm persuaded. I know from personal experience the faithfulness of my God. Friends, if you're persistent in something, it brings me to our second point about prayer, and that is the fact that it stands the reason that you're going to be passionate about it as well. Paul tells us, in this passage of Scripture here in Colossians 4, 2, that we should be vigilant in our prayers. You know, when you look at the life of Jesus, you'll discover that Jesus prayed with passion every time that he prayed. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, at his baptism by John there in the River Jordan, while I was praying, it says, the heavens open. Oh, my friend, I submit to you this morning that passionate prayer opens the heavens. It gets God's attention. God responds to the passionate prayer of his children. Again, in Luke 6, 12, the night before he called his disciples, it, we read in Scripture that Jesus spent the entire night in prayer. So passionate prayer gives us direction. If you've got decisions that need to be rendered, if you're not certain about certain things, be passionate in your prayer. It's amazing how God will give you guidance and direction in making decisions in life. Again, in his transfiguration in Matthew 17, while Jesus was praying, it says there that the appearance of his face, face became different and his clothing became white as the light. Passionate prayer allows you and I to experience the very presence of God. We sang about it early. Oh, the glory of his presence. In your presence, there is fullness of life. Amen? In your presence... You know, everything has a, has a way of fading away, and the only thing that you see is Jesus. And all friends, when you look in the face of the Master, suddenly you have a calmness, you have a peace, you have the assurance of knowing that God is in control and He's got your back. And I'm so thankful for that. Again, in Matthew 26, 39, one of the worst nights in Jesus' life as a man, when He was here on earth, dwelling among us, He was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and we see a life lived in a passionate prayer, enables us to submit our will to God's will, even in the most difficult of situations and circumstances. Remember Jesus' prayer, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus always prayed with passion because he knew who he was talking to. You know, sometimes we forget who we're talking to, don't we? Sometimes we forget that he's almighty God. Sometimes we forget just how powerful he is and how much he wants to release that power in your life and in mine. Passionate prayer is a prayer from the heart and not just a prayer from the head. James 5.16 tells us the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Paul continues here and tells us that the third thing we need to do when we pray is pray with thankfulness. He tells us he, that we are indeed to be thankful in all things. In all things, we are to be thankful. Thanksgiving is the natural result of being filled and living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Philippians 4, 6 tells us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything we should pray, giving thanks as we make our petitions known to God. When was the last time that you just prayed a prayer of thankfulness and thanksgiving? Lord, I'm not really here to ask for anything today. I'm not really here to ask you to do this for me or do this for someone else or whatever. Lord, I just wanted to tell you how thankful I am for, first of all, the gift of eternal life. For saving me, Lord, when I wasn't worthy of it. Lord, for the answered prayers, so many times, God, your faithfulness, for good health, I'm thankful, God, for a place to live, for a roof over my head, Lord, for food on my table, for a good family, for a good church family, Lord, I'm thankful. Have you ever just spent time in prayer thanking God for his many, many blessings? 
Paul instructs us in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 that giving thanks at all times is God's will for us in Jesus Christ. You see, giving thanks does several things in our lives. It articulates dependence and demonstrates a relationship with our Heavenly Father. When you are thanking God, I mean, come on, let's be honest as an individual. If you are constantly doing something for someone and they never acknowledge it, they never say thank you or whatever, how reluctant are you to go ahead and continue to do things for them after a certain amount of time? They never say thank you, it's, it's just expected, you know? You do something for them today, the next day they're there with their hand out, they've never said thank you or whatever, it's just like, you owe me, Teddy, you know? Do it. You owe me. I'm here with my hand out. I mean, yeah, I know I didn't say thank you or whatever, but that's okay. You're, you're supposed to do this. I mean, after all, you're supposed to be my friend. Well, how many times do we treat God the same way as our Heavenly Father? You know, look, I, I'm not, I'm not going to take time to thank you, but, but, you know, the Bible tells me that you're my Heavenly Father, so, so here, you owe me, Dad. Well, may I go on record and tell you that if I got what I deserved, I'd be in a lot of trouble. But thank God for his mercy and for his grace. Can you say amen? It also communicates gratitude. It also generates humility. Where I am not only expressing my gratitude to the Lord, but I am also in humbleness recognizing, God, I am completely dependent upon you. And Lord, I am thanking you that I have the wonderful privilege and opportunity to come to you in prayer and know that you're concerned enough about my life that no matter what the need is, I can come to you with it and know, Lord, that you'll hear my request. And however you choose to answer it, I know that you always have my best interest in mind. You know, I'm a firm believer that, that God answers prayer in three ways. Sometimes it's the affirmative. In other words, God says yes. Sometimes he answers in a way that we don't like, no. And the one that I really don't like is wait a while. Can you identify with that? But may I submit to you that God's timing is always perfect. And when God says no, it's because he has our best interest in mind. And when he says wait for a while, it's because the best that can result out of that situation, all the pieces aren't in place yet. But in God's perfect timing, the answer will come about to bring glory to his name. The fourth and last thing that we find about prayer is that we are to pray making intercession. Intercessory prayer is simply praying for others. As Pentecostals, you will find yourself praying in your heavenly language as the Holy Spirit enables you. This is referred to as praying in the Spirit. Maybe you don't come from a Pentecostal background, and maybe that's not familiar terminology, but praying in the Spirit simply means this. I begin praying out in my known language, whether it be English or, or whether it be Scandinavian, whether it be French, whether it be you know, Swahili or whatever it may be. But I start praying in my known language. And as I am praying, have you ever found yourself not being able to articulate what you're really feeling? or you feel like you're being redundant or whatever, well, it's then that the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to begin to pray in a heavenly language. And after all, friends, even though you don't understand what you're saying, you're praying to God. As long as He understands what you're saying, that's really all that matters, amen? And as you are praying, there's a release in your spirit, in your spiritual being, and you know that you're making communication with God, and God is hearing and what have you. And praise the Lord, as we are praying in the spirit, we know that the, pray, the spirit is also praying for us. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 7. Paul tells us, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Friend, I am so thankful today that I have a heavenly Father, praise the Lord, who is so interested in me that his Holy Spirit searches my heart. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows exactly what I stand in need of. And praise the Lord, he doesn't wait for me to articulate it. He doesn't wait for me to try to find the words. When I'm at a loss for words, he steps up and he begins praying for us. Can you say amen? That's the love of God. That's the love of a father. That's the love of someone who's concerned about you. Do not allow Satan to make you feel like you're all alone and God doesn't care. Oh, I would submit to you today that praying in the Spirit 
It's our nuclear option of prayer as a spirit-filled Christian. You talk about the power of an atomic bomb. You talk about the power of a nuclear bomb. Friends, I'm here to tell you today that a powerful intercessory prayer in the Spirit of God is explosive. It's dynamic prayer that destroys the strongholds of sin. It releases the dunamis dynamite power of God into the situation, and hell cannot withstand the power of Almighty God when you release His power into the situation. Intercessory prayer characterized the life of Jesus. In Isaiah 53, 12, the Bible tells us he himself bore the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors. On the cross, Jesus was praying for the others when he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not what they do not know what they are doing. Romans 8 34 tells us that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. Friends, I would humbly submit to you today that intercessory prayer really does change things. It really does. If we want to see things change, then it's going to take prayer on your part and on mine and more than just the cute little ditty prayers that we so many times are guilty of offering up. When I was 12 years old, my dad was having trouble finding a teacher for the 12 year old, or excuse me, for the junior high boys class in our church. Most of you know my, my dad was a preacher and I'm a preacher's kid. Finally, a elderly grandmother by the name of Hazel Hetrick volunteered. Now you can imagine as a 12 year old boy that my friends and I were skeptical and we found out who our teacher was going to be, we made it our mission to try her patience very quickly. But to our surprise, she revolutionized, revolutionized rather, our class in just a few months. She loved us. She disciplined us when we needed it. The other ones, not me. And most importantly, she prayed for us. Unfortunately, a short time later, she became ill. And we had fallen in love with her. She was Grandma Hazel. In just a few short months, we knew that this was a lady who genuinely loved us, who genuinely was concerned about us. And when she got ill, we prayed. Unfortunately, we found out that she had contracted cancer. And shortly after she died, she was our teacher for nine months. She's probably one of Several who most impacted my life, and one reason that I'm in ministry today is because of her. But I want to share with you, at her funeral, her adult daughter, who she lived with because Hazel was a widow. As she was sharing about her mother, she reached into her purse and pulled out a little black notebook. And she told us that on some of the pages there were pictures that Hazel had requested from us, school pictures. She had put them in there, and those who didn't have pictures in there, she had written names either underneath the photo or on a blank page. She had just written the name. And under our names were comments like having trouble in arithmetic or dad has a drinking problem and needs the Lord or would like to be a policeman someday but doesn't feel like he has what it takes. Her daughter told us that she often would hear her mother praying over each of those pages every night before she would go to bed. Her mother also told us that her mom would tell her from time to time she couldn't wait to go to church on Sundays to see what God was doing in our lives in response to the prayers that she had offered up. You see, when you pray for others, for God's will to be done in the lives of others as well as your own, He'll begin to use you in ways that will begin to astonish those around you. Sometimes I think we don't become what God wants us to become because we're too focused on ourselves and not on others. But I want to remind you this morning that we become more like Jesus when we pray for others. When you look at the prayers that Jesus offered up, it is amazing to me how many of those prayers are for others and not for himself. Have you ever noticed? And when we do so, God will open up new opportunities for us that we never dared to dream of. By the way, 
That Sunday school class, that junior high class, when Hazel took over, had eight boys in attendance. In the nine months that Grandma Hazel taught, we grew to 25 boys who rarely missed a Sunday. We could not wait for our Sunday school class. It was the highlight of our week. I kid you not. She was funny. She was a, a lady who loved us. And I remember that one of the ways that she punished us, now you have to remember as a 12-year-old boy, you're not real thrilled when an older lady wants to kiss you. And one of the ways that she would discipline us is give us a big kiss right in front of our buddies. You know, right on the cheek. Man, you'd turn as red as that floor where the red paint is. Your buddies would go, ah, oh, you know, make fun of you or whatever. But guess what? If you did, then you got a kiss too. So we learned real quick not to make fun. But she loved us. It was genuine love. The boy who had trouble with math became a school teacher. The boy's father, who had a drinking problem, got saved and gave up drinking. Five of my classmates served in different branches of the military, and three of them are retired Maryland State troopers. And oh yeah, I almost forgot two of us are Assemblies of God pastors. Not too bad for an elderly grandmother who recognized the importance of praying for others. Friends, as I close today, I, I want to encourage you, look. Let's not look at prayer as something that we only do in 9-1-1 or 9-11 situations. May it be our first option instead of our last in all situations of life. When I talk about war room prayer, I'm not trying to beat you over the head. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm simply saying that if I really seriously want to see this nation turn around, I recognize it's only going to happen when we pray. And there's power in numbers when we pray. My Bible tells me one shall put the flight a thousand, two shall put the flight ten thousand. So it's the law of the power of ten. You add a person, you multiply the previous number by the power of ten. You're adding another zero, in case you don't know what that means at the end of the number. Ten becomes a hundred. A hundred becomes a thousand. A thousand becomes ten thousand. Ten thousand becomes a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand becomes a million, and so on and so forth. You get my point. What I'm saying to you is this. We need you. I know this is the first, quote-unquote, official Sunday of NFL football, and you're not going to find a, a more passionate football fan than the one that's standing behind this pulpit. But where are my priorities? God could care less about the outcome of the football game. God could care, could not care any more than about the outcome of people's hearts when they face him in eternity. Let's get our priorities straight. So I ask you this morning, and this is a question that only you can answer, as only I can answer for myself. What does your prayer life look like? Are you really persistent in prayer? Or do you easily give up when you don't see the answer as quickly as what you had hoped? Are your prayers filled with intensity and passion? Do you pray with the kind of intensity that, that David Brainerd prayed for, the American Indians? Or John Knox prayed for the nation of Scotland where he said, Lord, give me this nation lest I die. When was the last time that you really cared about the spiritual condition? of our nation, and let me bring it even closer, of your co-worker, of your neighbor, or maybe even a family member. What about gratitude? Have you been negligent in thanking God for all that he's done for you, the many blessings that he does on a daily basis? And who are you praying for? Are you like the farmer who said, Lord, bless me, my wife, my son, John, his wife, us four, no more, amen? Or are you praying for others? Are you truly an intercessor for those in need around you? Friend, this is nothing new, but I'm a firm believer in this. Prayer really does change things. I'm going to say that again. Prayer really does change things. Trevor shared about his sister, Melinda, 
And I mean, the list could go on. I could go all across this congregation, Sherry Dixon and what God has done in her life and is continuing to do. I mean, there, there's so many of you here, and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but, but the point that I'm making is this. Prayer really changes things. It really does. But lack of prayer doesn't change anything. So I would simply end today by saying, let's stop talking about it and start praying every day. Let's not be guilty of just talking about it. Let's put it into practice every day and see what our God can and will do. Bow your head with me in prayer if you would. Lord, I, I just feel like right now I, I need to say forgive us, God, for not praying more than we do. And I'm not speaking for anybody else other, other than myself. Lord, I, I'm not going to stand here in judgment. I don't know how other people pray, how often they pray, how much time they spend in prayer. But I know in my own life, God, I need to make prayer more of a priority. Not just for situations and for people when they call and they say they have this need or that need. Or as I'm driving down the street and I see certain individuals, God, and many times your Holy Spirit will compel me to pray for them. How many times are we guilty Lord of saying, when someone says, please pray for me, yes, I will, and then we don't. Or maybe we'll pray for a day or for a week, and then we quickly forget and move on. Forgive us, Lord, for our busyness of life and focusing on the minors rather than the majors of what really is going to turn this world around. My heart is saddened today, Lord, when I think of 9-11, not only because of the events that took place 15 years ago and the tragic loss of lives, but Lord, when I look at us as a country, how in the days following 9-11, Lord, even our government officials, Lord, were spending time in prayer. Churches were packed. People were seeking the face of God, but how quickly we forget and how quickly we return to the regular routine of life. Holy Spirit, today, grip our hearts. Help us to understand the importance of being godly people and the prayer of Samuel of old, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. May we take this message to heart today, Lord. And I pray that we will become a praying people, a praying church. As has been prayed many times, I pray that we will become one of many churches that you're going to raise up in this valley to make a difference. God, I'll really care about my fellow man, my co-worker, my family member, my neighbor, Lord, who doesn't know you and is not serving you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, friend, I would simply ask you this morning, if you're here, and by chance, you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You've never recognized the need of calling out upon his name and confessing that Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm lost. And I need your forgiveness. I need you to come into my life as my personal Savior, as my personal Lord. And God, today, I want your Holy Spirit to search me out. No more excuses. No more hiding behind this or that. But Lord, today, just being totally transparent, asking you to become my Savior. If that's you this morning, with heads bowed, eyes closed, simply raise your hand and in so doing, you say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Jesus this morning. I know my heart's not right with God. I know I'm lost. But today I want to make things right. Today I want to call out upon the name of the Lord and know that he is my God. He is my risen King. If that's you, would you simply raise your hand that we might pray together with you. Anyone? You need the Lord today. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning. You're the searcher of all hearts. My prayer is that everybody within the sound of my voice this morning knows you as their Savior and their Lord. If by chance there would be someone here who does not, I pray that in the privacy of this moment that they would call out upon your name, asking you for forgiveness of their sins and welcoming you into their life as their Lord. I pray, God, that we will truly indeed become even more 
prayer warriors. Help us, O oh God, to recognize the importance of intercessory prayer. And Father God, that we'll incorporate it in our lives to such a degree or an extent that as we go throughout the day, that we'll be spent in prayer seeking you for guidance, for direction, being quick to thank you for answered prayers, looking for opportunities to share Jesus with those around us. We ask these things in your precious name. Amen. I want to remind you that tonight at 6 o'clock we'll be meeting here for War Room Prayer. I would love to see each and every one of you back and join with us in prayer and believing God for great things. I believe that it can be the start of something really good. So let me encourage you to come out as we pray for our nation and pray for others' needs. Second, I want to remind you, get busy inviting folks to church next Sunday. It's National Back to Church Sunday. Invite minimum of five people. If you've already invited five, invite five more. If you've already invited ten, invite five more. You get the drift. Let's fill this place up. Let's believe God for the impossible. Amen? Let's believe that the 80% of individuals in Rockingham County who are not in church, that we can believe for our part of that 80% here at First Assembly of God. Don't forget about next Sunday evening, the meal at 5 o'clock, the movie, Miracles from Heaven at 6. It's completely free of charge. We welcome you to come out and to join with us. And last but not least, in the new kitchen, we had some cast iron kettle baked brown beans left over from the yard sale yesterday. I can tell you from personal tasting them, eating them last night for dinner, they are good. They are available if you're interested. There'll be somebody in there. A pint is $4, a quart is $7. It's a fundraiser for the men's ministry. So if you're interested, feel free to help. God bless you. So good to have you here this morning. Sharon's going to close this out in a closing song. Stand together with me. Following that, you may consider yourself to be dismissed. <laughs>